America's being blitzed by R-rated movies. Now furious watchdogs say the sexy scenes are taking R too far. The R-rated movies are really getting more and more offensive. R tore pornography. Lean on me. This big brother saved a street kid from a life of despair. Then he saved him from jail for a crime he didn't commit. I feel like I own my life. My brother's keeper. Plus, a hidden camera look at an illegal after-hours underworld. And the video vamp queen hits the USA. Bonjour, America! Everyone, I'm Maureen O'Boyle. Welcome to A Current Affair for this Thursday, May 7th. A detective stops by to question a seductive blonde about a murder. Before you can say Columbo, they're in bed together. It's a scene from the number one movie, Basic Instinct, an R-rated picture that triggered national protest because of its sexual content. Now some watchdogs fear Basic Instinct is just more proof that the R rating, which was supposed to protect America's young people, has lost its teeth. Lyndall Marks reports on the movies some say are nothing more than hardcore pornography. It's sexually arousing to most men. It's getting more and more explicit. Very, very erotic. They are movies with an R rating slapped on them. A red flag for parents to accompany anyone under 17 wanting to see one of these hot films. But a battle is brewing over whether the R has gone too far too much sex and too much violence the r-rated movies are really getting more and more offensive there's more violence there's much more explicit sex what concerns you more the violence or the sex they both do i would say the sex is more harmful it has an impact you increasingly view sex as a commodity women as an object of sex uh, the sex scenes are an integral part of telling the story and maybe in this in this no generation days when uh, you can't do anything uh, we might just have to live out um, our sexual lives and fantasies through films i don't know anything that's not police business you know i don't wear any underwear michael douglas and sharon stone don't leave a lot to the imagination in the box office hit basic instinct i must seduce him with my mind i must seduce him with my sexuality i have to weave this 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 web that he cannot pull himself out of it's nice and for some basic instinct moviegoers that r was masquerading as an x this film really is i think the most extreme example of uh you know, of under-labeling a film. Still not an appropriate movie for a 17-year-old child. I didn't think they needed to have as much nudity as they did. I thought they should have cut some of the scenes out or made it an X. The Scarlet Letter X no longer rates since the movie Henry and June was released. The filmmakers felt an X associated their artwork with pornography. We're taking the name X and discarding it and putting a new name on this category, NC-17, no children under 17 admitted. But are these letters attached to a movie really a question of numbers? There are patrons who won't patronize an R-rated film, and that is one of the reasons why the studios frequently will fight very hard to get a rating changed from an, initially from an R to a PG-13 or from an NC-17 to an R. If there's an R-rated film, uh, I think there are a lot of people who will go, whether the story is any good or not, just to see some naked bodies uh, performing uh, unusual things. And what about those naked bodies who are performing? In Poison Ivy, 17-year-old Drew Barrymore discovered that off-screen there's not a lot to hide when you're an R star. Half the movie, more than half, was walking around in underwear, a bra, top, I mean, I was running around that set with no clothes on all the time. And 21-year-old Nina Shimasko was exposed. In the new release, Wild Orchid 2, Two Shades of Blue. You take your clothes off. It's, it's a bit exciting because you have nothing on and, and um, there's no, I mean, you have nothing to hide. It's done to titillate. It's done to bring an audience in. I prefer to go to a movie 
and get titillated that way in this day and age, um, I think it's better. Did it titillate you? Not that much. I prefer to be titillated by my wife. Bye-bye. These box office hits make millions of dollars. So while the demand is as hot as the films, Hollywood will keep turning up that R-rated heat. Sex and violence appear to be high on the list at the Cannes Film Festival, which opens tomorrow. Four minutes cut out of the U.S. version of Basic Instinct have been put back in. Now, still ahead on A Current Affair, we'll take you along as our hidden cameras expose a shadowy world where night and day become one. Who's got the pay? Anybody? These card players are gambling they won't get caught by cops. The secrets of illegal after-hours clubs later. And up next... Big Brotherly Love gets an innocent kid off a murder rap. Grace Kelly, Hollywood's Ice Maiden or the Princess of Passion. Now a current affair looks between the sheets. Amazing Grace. When Rick Conway joined the Big Brother program, he knew he could make a difference in someone's life. He had no idea how right he was. If it weren't for Rick, an innocent young man would be spending the rest of his life in prison. David Lee Miller met the hero who is proud to say, he's my brother's keeper. Conway's on him. He's in his face. Smith tries to go around. And he goes up. Oh, and it's good again. Put your hand up top your head! Now more than ever, there's a lesson to be learned on this basketball court in Richmond, Virginia. Here in the city that was once the capital of the Confederacy, Melvin Smith and Rick Conway stand taller than any monument. What a shot by Kareem Smith. The plain fact of the matter is that Melvin and I are friends. I feel like I own my life. What happened to Melvin Smith should never have happened. Think fast. Melvin Smith and Rick Conway are more alike than you might think. Both are from the streets. Rick was a cop turned prosecutor. Melvin, nicknamed Bug, was from a single parent family in a rough part of town. They met through the Big Brother program four years ago, when Melvin was 12. Friends of few words, they shared a special bond. He sort of gave me somebody that I could look up to and, you know, feel comfortable talking to. I really wanted to be uh, something special in someone's life who was otherwise maybe less privileged. He has a lot to offer. Uh, Especially a boy 12, no matter what color. Well, you know the best way to gain a little weight where you need it. Yeah. In the weight room. Exactly. Slowly their friendship grew. They saw each other several times a week. And on weekends, they sometimes went camping or fishing. Rick offered advice, and Melvin listened. Did you take what he had to say seriously? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Didn't go in one ear and out the other? No, I didn't. When I was your age, I didn't listen. I listen. I know even what he said. But in the summer of 1990, everything changed. Rick took a job as a prosecutor in another county, two hours away from Richmond. I just wanted to instill in him the understanding that I was always there for him. If I wasn't there physically, I was just a phone call away. What began as a test of their friendship would soon become a matter of life and death. Here, outside Melvin's apartment complex, a 19-year-old pizza delivery man was gunned down during an attempted robbery. Two months after the murder, Melvin was fingered as the trigger man. The gunman came running up, had a 22 rifle, shot him once as he tried to get into the car. He staggered into the car, got behind the driver's seat, tried to start the car, and the gunman shot five more times and literally executed him. At least until the outcome of his upcoming trial, this was Melvin's new home, the Richmond Juvenile Detention Center. And this, a 9 by 7 cell, the type of place he would spend the rest of his life if convicted of murder. It was the most desperate time of Melvin's young life, but still he refused to call the one person who could help, his big brother, Rick. Melvin was, was pretty clear with me that he didn't want me to contact Rick. and. Um... I think he was embarrassed. You were facing possibly the electric chair or life in jail. Yeah. And you never called Rick. I don't know. Um, I, 
I was thinking that he would be more disappointed in me for getting myself into something like that, even though it wasn't my fault. By sheer coincidence, Rick found out about Melvin's murder charge after noticing this article in a local newspaper. When I saw the nickname Bug was used in that article, I realized that uh, this was my little brother that was charged with a, a violent, violent act. I knew Melvin didn't do that. I knew Melvin did not riddle this young man's body with bullets the way it was described. And that's when I started making some phone calls. The next day he was here. He went down to the juvenile and talked with Melvin. But the whole thing was just like a nightmare. When he saw me, he, his face lit up and he, this big grin came over his face. And uh, I really need to just grab him and embrace him at the time. And I told him that uh, things look bad right now, but it was gonna all work out. Melvin told Rick that he was watching TV with his girlfriend at the time of the murder. Although afraid of violating the street's code of silence, Melvin confided to Rick he knew the name of the real killer. Now it was up to Rick to prove his little brother's innocence. It's what I call the Perry Mason theory of defense law, and that is you don't just show that your client didn't do it, you prove who did do it. So the prosecutor turned detective for the defense. And for two weeks, Rick pounded the pavement, searching for clues, until finally he received a tip that led him here to a city sewer and the bullets from the missing murder weapon. And I popped the cover off of the sewer. Just like now, there was a lot of water and a lot of debris. So I brought the police investigator out here, and I pointed out this sewer. I suggested that he have the city pump all the debris out of there. When he did that, he found the jar of bullets. But it was this letter, written by a jailhouse snitch, that finally set Melvin free. It proved Melvin had been framed by an inmate looking for reward money. Melvin Smith was a totally innocent person. He wasn't even present when the crime was committed. That's what our system is designed to protect against. And it didn't work. Where would Melvin Smith be tonight if not for Rick Conway? It's very likely that uh, Melvin Smith would be behind bars. The real killer, Sean Marshall, was sentenced to 62 years behind bars. After six weeks in jail, Melvin was set free. All thanks to Rick and his faith in his little brother. He's really been a help to us, and he's been that role model that I knew he would be. And I love him just like a big brother. It's the hook! Oh no, it's the hook! Today, Melvin and Rick continue their friendship. And like any brother, Melvin was at Rick's side last December when Rick married Suzanne. We never were the type of guys to do much hugging, but we did some through this ordeal, and we realized that we can count on each other now. I'm glad that I met Rick, and I feel like we should be big brothers forever. It's a great story. Melvin now says he also plans to further the aims of the Big Brother program. He wants to counsel other teenagers who've gotten off track. Now, when we come back, we'll take you undercover for an eye-opening look at the people who are still partying while the rest of America's going to work. They dance till dawn, but they'll face the music if the law finds out. And later, a sex kitten gets her claws into America. Next week, she'll always be first lady in the hearts of America. Now, A Current Affair takes you inside the world of Jackie O. When the DJ stops the music and the lights go up at the local night spot, most of us are ready to head home. But some people just can't get enough. So they head to the underground world of after-hours clubs. But they could be risking a good time for jail time if the night spot's illegal. John Johnston and our hidden camera catch the action of the night crawlers. You're, going, you're moving, you're doing things that are going to keep you awake at the same time. So where are you going to go? You're going to go to after hours, you're going to go wherever you're going to go. Friday night at one of the hottest dance clubs in the country, Club New in Miami Beach. Scenes like this are going on in hundreds of clubs throughout America. People out on Friday night looking good and looking to have a good time. Who's 
Dance clubs have made a big resurgence since their heyday of disco in the 70s. On this night, with closing time approaching, this party looks like it's just starting. So when they stop serving drinks at four in the morning, and you don't want to call it a night, what is there to do? A current affairs camera's found plenty. The legal after hours clubs where the party goes on and the betting starts regardless of the law. Four o'clock in the morning, the whole world opens up. It's like totally underground. In Miami, we found this legal option. Uptown opens at two in the morning and has been so for almost 20 years. People have natural rhythms too. When they're in a good mood, they seem to want to go until the sun comes up. Steve Polisar's father started the club in the early 70s. It was a time of fast money and interesting clientele. Some mobsters were in, have been in Miami and other cities, and they go out at night, and it's true that some of them, you know, were directed over here. Uh, one night, we, I think we had uh, George Foreman in, heavyweight champ of the world, right after he won the title. When the other clubs close down, if I'm out, if I'm working late, if there's something happening, I want to go out, I want to have a little bit of fun. In New York City, there are not any legal options to drink after 4 a.m., and 4 a.m. is the time for night crawlers. Come as you are. We frisk everyone down, make sure no one has nothing on them. You know, we keep a clean club. Tonight, there were over 100 people here, of various ages and in various states of mind. I like to party, and people always want to party always want to party you know and the city you know nighttime is is the best time to hang and party they don't want to know what you're doing you don't want to know what they're doing just keep to your own business it's darker you can hide manny has been tending bar and after hours clubs for about 10 years has its good points and it's bad yeah what's the good and bad points a decent money for a short period of time the bad is the hours and the risk the risk is getting arrested and going to jail. In the New York City borough of the Bronx, a different type of crowd has gathered. A current affair found this location where at four in the morning, the bar closes and opens up again to a new clientele. This is a place where mostly locals come to drink and gamble. This card game will go on sometimes until 11 in the morning. These places are illegal. So how do they stay open with so many people coming in and out? We don't run above board, but uh, the fire codes and everything like that are met. We make sure that uh, the safety first. And after a location gets a little too long, you know, and stuff like that, you try to find a different location. Regardless of the location, the patrons always seem to stay a step in front of the law and know where to go. I've been to places where they have bands that go on at 9.30 on a Sunday oh, really? morning. Once people are having fun, they don't want to stop. We'll be right back with the uninhibited rock star who's determined to grab Madonna's crown. Her private hell was shared by us all. But do we really know the woman behind the dark sunglasses? A current affair unravels the mystery of oh, Jackie O. The material girl might want to look over her shoulders these days because there's a new star on the charts who's determined to out Madonna, Madonna. She's already stripped for her music video, but we could see even more if that's possible. George Chicarone tells us why. This 21-year-old French-Canadian sensation is steaming up the dance video charts in this country with her first American release, Deep Kiss. Mitsu is celebrated in the Great White North for her nude videos and straight talk about sex. Bonjour, America! Now on her first U.S. tour, the new to the north greeted a current affair in her bubble bath for an intimate interview. Uh, sexuality is very hidden in the society, you know. Maybe because I come from Montreal and it's much more, maybe more open because we have a European side. Sexuality is why you have babies, you know. It's, it's, it's a part of, of the nice things in the world. 
Mitsu and her racy routine have music fans talking. Probably a lot of people will protest about it. I might not change the channel when it comes on, though. The hot-blooded French-Canadian says, come on, America, loosen up. We are women, we are sexy, and that's it. We have breasts, you know. Why should we hide them? They're there for something. Meet Sue's in Providence, Rhode Island tonight. She'll be in Los Angeles and New York next month. Now, coming up on The Current Affair, another star with sex appeal galore. Grace Kelly, Hollywood's ice maiden or the princess of passion. Now a current affair looks between the sheets. Amazing Grace. That story and more Friday on A Current Affair. And that's all for tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Sean Connery, Dustin Hoffman, and Matthew Broderick star in Family Business, Saturday night at 9. Stick around now for WKRP in Cincinnati on KDSM Fox 17.